Welcome back to our channel. Today I will talk about a 2016 drama crime movie based on a true story titled Just Mercy. Without further ado, let's get started. In 1987, in Monroe County, Alabama, Walter Johnny D. McMillian, an African-American owner of a small pulping business, was detained, found guilty, and given the death penalty for assassinating an 18-year-old woman, Rhonda Morrison. Besides the false allegations, he was kept in jail until the day of execution. The movie then switches to Brian Stevenson, an idealistic young Harvard law student who pays a visit to a local jail in Jackson, Georgia. While meeting with Henry, a convicted murderer, informs him that the Southern Prisoners Defense Committee, where he works as an intern, has sent him to tell Henry that they will arrange a lawyer for him soon. Brian adds that he is not at risk of execution anytime next year. Hearing this, Henry feels relieved. The two laugh and share their childhood experiences when a police officer approaches, brutally taking Henry with him. Brian cannot believe his eyes after seeing helpless Henry like this. Two years later, after graduating, Brian rejects lucrative job offers and decides to move to Alabama to defend wrongly condemned prisoners, or those who cannot afford proper legal representation, hoping to fight for their freedom. He meets his colleague, Eva Ansley, in Alabama, with whom he has planned to open legal services to death row convicts. Eva and Brian encounter their first obstacle when a white man who meant to rent them an office refuses to do so after learning that they are lawyers for death row inmates. Infuriated about the situation, Eva decides to start their work from home before they find an official place. Back in Eva's house, she explains how she was influenced by story of a death row convict, which forced her to find someone that could help. Eva was about to give up when she got a call from a Harvard lawyer stating that he had federal funding to start a legal center for inmates on death row. According to her, she was in before Brian even offered her this job. He heads to a prison to visit six convicts and is told to take off his clothes. Confused, Brian responds that attorneys aren't strip searched for legal visits. However, the officer refuses to let him visit unless he strips. After being examined, he gets in touch with his clients, who tell him about the inappropriate behavior of judges and lawyers towards them. While speaking about his sentence story, Herbert Richardson explains to Brian about being a Vietnam War soldier and getting PTSD. He informs Brian that although he put the bomb on someone's porch, he didn't mean to kill anybody. Johnny D seems fed up with the lawyers who run after the money runs out. He has already tried everything to get him out of his death sentence, so he doesn't anticipate anything remarkable from Brian. According to Johnny D, Brian doesn't know what he is into because soon authorities will eat him alive and spit him out, just like every other black man who steps out of line. He continues that Brian doesn't know how it feels to be found guilty without fingerprints and evidence but a fake witness who made the whole thing up. Out of disappointment that Brian won't be able to do anything for them, Johnny leaves. Back in the cell, Herbert thinks of Brian as a nice lawyer, but according to Johnny and Ray, being nice can only get you in prison. He goes back to Eva's home and attempts to look up the files of the people he met. He informs Eva in the morning that Johnny D is innocent because Ralph Myers, who provided the evidence supporting his allegation, has spent most of his life in and out of jail and was convicted for a different murder case then. Furthermore, another witness named Bill Hooks stated in his testimony that Johnny's truck was on the side of the road where the murder occurred. Eva and Brian think Myers approached the police, who were unable to solve the case in one year, with an offer to reveal the identity of the murderer in exchange for his low sentence. Brian decides to meet the DA, Tommy Chapman, who used to be a public defender, and thinks he might not be aligned with other authorities. The next day, he visits Mr. Chapman, to whom Brian informs his concerns about the reliability of Johnny's conviction. Chapman thinks that Johnny caused a lot of pain to many folks in Monroe County, and if Brian digs those wounds, he will make numerous people unhappy. However, Brian responds that his job is to achieve justice for his clients, not to make people happy. He gets out of the office and witnesses three black men arrested and taken to jail. Brian heads his way to Johnny's home and meets his wife, Minnie, and other family members. They are sure that there is no way Johnny can commit a crime like this. Moreover, on the morning of the murder, Johnny had a fish fry party with his family to raise money for the church while working on his truck with John, Johnny's son. He was there the whole time. As they talk, one family member reveals that Johnny cheated on his wife. After he was witnessed messing around with the white woman, her husband told everybody. But, according to Minnie, people kept making stories and made him a cheater to a drug dealer and then to a murderer. Although Minnie was hurt after her husband's cheating, he was her kid's father. To pursue the case, Brian is told to convince Johnny D. Before leaving for home, Brian meets Darnell, John's friend, who informs him that Bill's testimony is false. 
Bill was with him that morning, fixing the head gasket on a Camaro. However, police locked him up for burglary, and after the statement, they set him free with all charges dropped. At first, Darnell hesitates to sign the statement, but later agrees to help Brian reopen the case. The following day, Brian sees Johnny D. He already knows about Brian's visit to his family and is very impressed witnessing his struggle, but he is confused about why a Harvard lawyer is taking major cases of death row convicts, to which Brian tells his grandfather's story of being murdered over a black and white TV. No one helped him, and he realized that outside of his community, no one even cared. He knows what it's like to be in the shadows. That's why he is doing this. Johnny agrees to let Brian reopen his case file. Herbert's execution date has been announced. As Eva and Brian talk about Herbert, Eva gets a threat that her house will explode if she doesn't stop working with Johnny D. She knows that walking on this road won't be easy, but she will achieve her aims anyhow. Both have started working on their first step in Johnny's case to find someone in town who can talk about the incident. No one wants to speak against the girl's family, but a former police officer lets him in the house to talk. Soon, Eva and Brian rent a building and name their organization Equal Justice Initiative. On the other hand, a police arrested Darnell while he was on his shift in front of his boss. Darnell is infuriated with Brian for getting him into the situation and decides to back off, stating, Tell Johnny D I am sorry. Brian gets annoyed with the state, but when he goes to Sheriff Tate, he finds the DA sitting there laughing. It seems like both have made the plan so that they can stop Brian. During the conversation, DA informs him about the denial of his motion to reopen the case. Brian leaves the office in anger. In prison, Johnny D and Brian discuss their next move. After Darnell, they plan to talk to Ralph Myers directly. As Brian joins Myers in the prison cafeteria, he refuses to tell anything related to Johnny D. But somehow, Brian successfully makes him talk about his testimony. Myers states that he was questioned about the girl's murder the day he was arrested. Adding more, he says that after the incident, everybody just cared about who murdered the girl and nothing else. He continues that when people care about a thing this much, they can do anything to get what they want. Saying this, he leaves. Brian is suspicious that Myers was questioned about Rhonda Morrison on 3rd of June, but the testimony represented in the court was recorded almost two months later. Eva and Brian think that the police is hiding his first statement. In search of it, Brian visits Escambia Courthouse and reviews Myers' case files. Luckily, he gets a solid clue that negates his second testimony of Myers. In the recording, he explains to Sheriff Tate that he doesn't know anything about Rhonda Morrison's death, while rejecting Tate's offer to frame an innocent man for murder. Eva is shocked to hear the truth that Johnny D was telling from day one. Herbert's execution day is tomorrow, but Johnny D clams him down and suggests waiting until the last moment because he believes in Brian. In the morning, Brian gets a call from the court about his motion denial for the delay of Herbert's execution. Soon, Herbert is put to death by electrocution in Alabama, as ordered by the jury. Although Brian is broken down, he gets up and fights for other death row convicts. While talking about the truth of his first testimony, Myers admits that he was threatened to be put on death row and was tortured until he testified what they wanted him to. Brian wants him to tell this truth in court soon. While in the court, Myers seems confused about his answers, but later confesses telling a lie about Johnny D back then. Brian's claims become stronger when Myers' doctor testimonies about Myers being mentally ill after getting an electric shock from the state. Moreover, the former police officer whom Brian had met before testified that Rhonda's body was face down and not face up as described by Myers. He added that he refused to tell a lie to the court, after which he was fired from his job. A month has passed and the court has refused to grant Johnny D a trial due to the unavailability of conclusive evidence about Ralph Myers lying during the first testimony. Johnny is ordered to return to Hallman Correctional Facility where he will face death. Brian is disturbed as he thinks he has made things worse for Johnny's family. However, in prison, Johnny thanks Brian because he is giving him and his family the truth and nobody can take this from them. But Brian isn't thinking of quitting. He is preparing a motion to submit their evidence to the state Supreme Court in Montgomery. It has the power to reverse the last decision and force the circuit court to give them a new trial. He makes an appearance of 60 minutes to gain public support for Macmillan and then files an appeal with the Alabama Supreme Court. The circuit court's ruling is overturned by the Supreme Court, which has also granted Johnny D a new trial. However, Tommy Chapman is asking the court to stay the proceeding. He approaches Chapman at his residence and urges him to support his motion. Chapman furiously kicks him out. On the motion's scheduled date, Brian addresses the judge in an appeal. Johnny D is ultimately reunited with his family after Chapman decides to support him in his motion, which results in the case being dropped. 
The epilogue mentions that Brian Stevenson and his attorneys have won relief, reversals and release for over 140 death row prisoners. Stevenson and Macmillan remained friends up until Stevenson's passing in 2013 from early onset dementia. Anthony Ray Hinton, a former cellmate of Johnny D's, spent 28 years on death row before Brian Stevenson got the charges withdrawn, while Hinton was subsequently freed in 2015. If you already watched this movie, please share your reviews with us in the comments below. And before you go, make sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel.